was um, I was trying to talk to our yeah. I was I was trying to get a fellows room for all the fellows in the VA cardiology and my my room is really perfect for fellow. You you saw my room. Unfortunately, I I couldn't find an office elsewhere to do it. But I think in the future we really should push for a fellow room there as well. Okay, I'm gonna talk about uh, Matt wanted me to talk about clinical trials and guidelines. And uh, I actually, my whole profession grew, grew up through the, the trials uh, of ICD trials. So I know almost in detail every trial uh, about ICD. So I'm gonna start a case presentation of 60 year old. These are all hypothetical cases for you. And, and you will see how some, some of them are very difficult ones. So 60 year old uh, gentleman with a ischemic cardiomyopathy with a myocardial infarction a year ago, EF back then was 30%. And uh, presented with the second MI uh, with a peak of 5 Angel showed the LAD no, uh, stent, but no stent restenosis, but RCA was 70%. At the time, uh, no PCI was done. Echo at the time of uh, the second MI uh, showed EF of 25% with anterior wall echinosis. What would you do next? Uh, one is ICD without further delay. Two, uh, B is wait for 40 days after MI, then ICD if EF is still low. C, PCI or RCA and then reassess EF in three months. Uh, D is PCI, RCA, or assess EF in 40 days. And E is wait for 40 days after MI, then reassess EF and functional status. So who wants to pick one? D? B or D? You want a D? You want a D, okay. So, uh, so let's let's go on because I I think uh, I think toward the end of the toward the end of the uh, toward the end of the talk, I hope uh, you can answer this question. Case number two, 75. So you can see that's very difficult, right? Because it already has three different answers. Number two case uh, is a 75-year-old man, cabbage, limit LED, uh, SVG, PDA, OM, one week ago. History MI 10 years ago. And found to have a third degree block post uh, uh, heart, of uh, course, uh, cabbage was thought to be irreversible. And six beats of non-sensitivity was observed. And the surgeons uh, really, really want me to do ICD. Pre-op EF was 25%. What to do next? ICD before discharge, or pacemaker and wait for three months before assessing EF or ICD. Which one? Pacemaker or ICD? <laughs> <laughs> I should give you a third option. <laughs> okay, anybody? Is it clear to you? It's not clear, right? So, okay. So it's not clear, so you're gonna hear of my talk and hopefully it'll be clear to you. Case number three is a 45 year old man present with a shortness of breath in one month's duration. Echo showed the global hypokinesis EF 30%. Angiogram showed non obstructive CAD and prescribed all the heart failure meds and what to do next. Number one, so optimal medical therapy for nine months, then ICD if EF remains low. Number two, optimal therapy three months. ICD VF is still low and unlikely to improve. Number three, optimal therapy for three months and ICD referral depends on the EF and functional status. And number four is ICD without delay. C? Who says C? C. C is right, and uh, I'm going to go, uh, let's just go through this, okay? So C is right, and then we're going to. Why not A? Why not A? Yes. That's right. That's yeah. right. So, yeah. But but the 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 thing is that <laughs> the thing is that the C is right because nine months okay, but if nine months the functional class is still right, right. So you miss that part, right? So you need to have two parts. So that's the trick. So the guidelines from the 2006, 2008, and then 2013. So. There's some uh, evolution. 
but I think the 2008 one is really the most uh, useful one for for you guys to to really remember because this is for your board exam that they're going to examine you on those. Okay, so so the the guideline for primary prevention for ICD. So number one is that is EF lower than 35 percent due to prior myocardial infarction at least 40 days. Okay, remember if you got MI and if you don't have re revascularization, you at least wait for 40 days. And function class has to be two or three, not one, okay, for MI. So number two is non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, low EF, and who got function class two and three. Those are Scott Hef. The first one is Scott Hef and uh, Dynamite. Okay, Dynamite is one of the 40-day waiting period. If you don't wait for 40 days, the, uh, the RCD benefit is not there. So number three, the ICD indicated this is MADE2. But MADE2 did not wait for 40 days. So this is MADE2 plus dynamite. So it's a 30% EF or lower with the history of MI and functional class one, right? So you only need a functional one, minimum functional uh, heart failure. And last one is a mass protocol uh, patient. So EF is lower than 40%, non system VT, CAD history, and inducible VT. And that's for ICD, okay? So just remember those four categories for heart failure and for uh, MI patients. Then those will cover most of your board exam. So this is the 2013 AHA ACC guideline for heart failure management. And in this, there's a twitch. You know, compared with the 2008 one, it's all 35% class two heart failure, but they added, this is, essentially added a duration of how long you want to optimize medical therapy if you're non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. In this heart failure one, they say nine months, okay? We don't follow that uh, in, in our EP, because my, nine months we think they dropped dead, too many of them. So we wanted to, to so my practice is always about three months, uh, just like a PCI and cabbage patient, but, but then uh, actually that was actually supported uh, by the European guideline recently, I'll show you later. So if you have MI 30% or less, this is made it two, which is the same as the, uh, the 2008. So remember this 2008 one, okay? 2008 one, now if you have heart failure, a nine ischemic, the waiting time in the American guideline is nine months still. But in the European guidelines, it's actually now is three months. So it agree with me now. So I've been always doing three months, and now I think uh, validated by the European just guideline just published in August. The, uh, just because it can be a little uh, confusing, yeah. uh, the, regardless of revascularization uh, after an MI, right? Even if you no revascularization or if you revascularize. If you, if you don't revascularize, 40 day waiting period. If you revascularize, three months. Three months, it's 90, right? Yeah, 90 days. Yeah. If, if there's no revascularization, 40 days. Right, that's right. So this is going to be on your general cardiac board for sure, okay? So my rest, the remaining of my talk is going to be on the updated guidelines uh, for from the 2015 this year, a few months ago, the European guidelines. And then the last year, uh, the guideline is the AHA, uh, ACC, and heart rhythm study guideline. It's not a guideline, it's a consensus statement. And, and we actually right away jump into that and, and, and really a, apply it to practice. And this is a, uh, published in mid of uh, last year, very, very recent. And those, the consensus statement covered the patient population not traditionally uh, tested in, the, uh, in all the ICD trials, which is very useful. I'm going to go through some of the ones related to today's talk, which is the primary prevention of ICD. So this is the one that European guidelines just published in August about how long you're going to wait. RCD therapy recommend reduce uh, sudden death in patients with symptomatic heart failure two to three, EF lower than 35% after three months, right? Three months after medical therapy who at least can uh, expect survival of more than a year. So, so this is actually deviated from the American guideline of heart failure guideline, which is nine months. Dr. Anand and I usually debate about this, and he always say I overuse ICD because I have not waited for nine, nine months, and I never follow that guideline. I think uh, three months is already, if you look at people that die each year, it's about 15% of mortality in low EF patients a year, 15% a year. So per month is over 
you know, 1.5%. 1, 1. So it's too high. Waiting for nine months, I think it's too high waiting, okay? And so uh, this is the, uh, uh, the transplant. I think this is one day for heart transplant bridging. And this is actually, is a two-way indication, uh, specifically uh, stated in this guideline. RCD should be considered for primary prevention in patients who listed for heart transplant. And so in the past, this is kind of a wishy-washy because of the, a lot of time, uh, the patient is a class four heart failure. And so for RCD implant, it's considered to be contraindication. Right? If you class for heart failure. But if you class for heart failure and you, you already are on the way to transplant evaluation, you should get ICD. Yeah. Life West, how much? Uh, so, well, number one, Life West is very expensive, so you go forever, and number two is not reliable. Life West, uh, patient will take off and taking shower and do all kind of stuff, and sleep on Life West is very, very, very uncomfortable. Oh yeah, I mean, if you're short, but how do you predict how short, right? So, so I'm gonna just quickly go over. I think uh, we're gonna run out of time. Yeah, it's, it's okay. So I'm gonna quickly go over some of the historical uh, rationale behind all the trial design and why we did all the study and made it and made it to Scott Hep. So this is about post MI patient risk. If you look at this, the largest uh, one of the large study of beta block about beta blocking trial for post MI trials. Ninety five percent people on beta blocker, seven hundred patient post MI, and two year after discharge. If you look at the, the uh, six months, uh, sixty months of follow up, what the most striking is that the cardiac mortality tumor is all increase over time. But but look at the sudden death mortality increase after about twelve, uh, eight, eighteen months. So there's a delayed sudden death risk in people post MI. No question that if you think you can get over 30 days, uh, 40, first 40 days, you're fine. It's not true. Actually, 18 months and later, now when you form the scar, and that's related to sudden death risk increase over here. So that's the historical thinking about made it and made it too. People form scar, the risk of sudden death is higher even after waiting a long time. So those are effects, these are all comers. No comer. And I'm going to show the EF1 correlation of post MI also. So those are the uh, the gusto and, and, and MEDIT2. Uh, but gusto, those are the ones, the early days of thrombolytic trials and MEDIT2. Looking at the one year mortality of post MI patients, what are the associated risk factors for, for the uh, sudden death risk? And if you look at this, is all cause mortality, not sudden death. Post MI. Uh, all comers is about 2.5%. But if you post MI with a depressed EF, knock out a lot of EF, your one year mortality is up to 10%. But if you have post MI and you have low EF plus ventricular tachycardia, your one year mortality is up to 25%. So low EF and VT seem to be the one that put the patient at a much higher risk. Huh? Sustained. Yes, sustained VT, yeah. So, these are the two-year data from those long-term follow-ups. Sorry, the top one. Yeah. So looking at all-cause mortality post MI two-year data, and there's a this is a large patient population. Looking at correlation, lower than 30% versus greater than 50%. The lower the EF post MI, the higher chance of total mortality, all-cause mortality, and so that's been known. So therefore, based on those uh, back background info, the made it. Uh, made it when it was designed. I can't go down for some reason. Here we are. So what about outside the arena of MI, the heart failure ones, okay? Without the MI, heart failure, just outcome of heart failure, class two, class three, and class four. Those are the systolic heart failure ones. The diastolic ones, we know the sudden death is high, but there's not a single trial so far to really gear towards ICD use for diastolic failure. So those are the sudden deaths uh, looking at class two, three, and four in, uh, in uh, the merit uh, HF study and, and the Lancet study. Looking at the class two heart failure, more than half people die suddenly, the other half are pound, pound failure. As you go up to class four heart failure, most people die of pump failure, but you still got one third of people die of sudden death. 
And those are the reasons why the gut health was designed, right? So they designed to include all those heart failure people, irregardless of the etiology of heart failure, because their sudden death risk is very, very high, very high. So this is the Netherlands follow-up of all comers is over about 10,000 people uh, in the community, and then they follow those people for sudden death, and they got quite a bit of people that die suddenly in the community. And they come back and look at the etiology or the EF, uh, EF correlation with those people who died uh, in the prospective uh, community patient follow-up. And they found that, again, verify the post-MI data in MIDI2 and, and the GUSTO data. That the higher, the lower the, the EF population, the higher chance of sudden death in the community patients. So that led into all the trials. I'm just going to quickly go uh, look at the Kaplan Mile curve and then go a little bit detail in some of the trials. So in the CAD, why is it? Can I get rid of that? Okay. All right. So in terms of CAD cardiomyopathy, there's four trials uh, that cabbage pet trials did not show any difference in mortality with ICD. And that trial has been criticized many times. And that trial included people who got signal every EKGs at the screening, and then the uh, uh, patient going for cabbage, and then randomizing to uh, ICD, no ICD. There's no difference. You know, people who do not like ICD, they will always call this data. Cabbage trial doesn't show mortality benefit if you do ca cabbage. And there's, I'm not going to go into detail of this, but there's a lot of flaws about this research. Mass was the first study uh, that was when I was doing my uh, my first year fellowship. So that was a CAD patient, doesn't have to be having MI, CAD or MI, and the non VT, all you need is three beats, or uh, greater than 100 beats a minute, and EF is lower than 40%. And back then, we used EP study as a guide. If you, EP study is negative, patient get released home. They don't even get in, you know, keep in, inpatient. If you're positive, then you random lying to ICD versus drug therapy. And it turns out that if you have low EF, an average EF in mass is about 30%, okay? Even though they enroll patient lower than 40%, average is about 30% EF. And if you're inducible by EP study for inducible VET, ICD is better than, than medical therapy. So that's the first trial ever looking at EP study based or guided uh, ICD therapy. And, and because of uh, analyzing the MAST uh, subgroup and, and MAST registry study and uh, resulting the MADE-2 as the MADE-1, MADE-1 is actually looking at just MI patient, okay, instead of I mean, MI or CAD. MI patient with EF of lower than 30%, uh, 35%, sorry, and then and, and try to induce it uh, with the EP study. So you essentially try to verify the MAST except the EF is lower, 35%. They want to make it even look more stringent. And that also repeated exactly what the must say. So if you induce uh, by EP study for VET, and RCD is better than medical therapy. So looking at the must and made it, what they found about is that in the registry, people who are negative in EP study, that not, not inducible, or who are inducible, they decide not to go for ICD. Their mortality is just as high. So what it means is that the EP study did not really select out the, the high-risk patient. So the, if you low EF, you mortality just as bad. doesn't matter if you're EP positive or negative. So that result in the MADE-2 study is looking at just lower than 35, uh, 30% EF, history of MI, no EP study. And they clearly showed mortality benefit, okay? So... Those are the post, uh, those are the CAD cardiomyopathy patient, right? So, and and the two trials is re address the acute MI, and those are, uh, just happened the last couple of years. One is called a dynamite. Dynamite study is enroll the patient uh, acute MI within the 40 day window, and and follow up uh, for two years. Oh, sorry, for four years, and there is no difference in mortality. So if you enroll patient early because of low EF. Acute MI with low EF, doesn't matter. IRIS is another uh, study, also acute MI patient, there's no difference. So if you enroll patient early, there's no difference if EF is low. 
So then the last two are the heart failure ones. One is called a Scott Hef, uh, and uh, everybody know that made it into the guideline because it's totally unbiased NIH-sponsored study. And looking at all comers, low EF 35% or lower with class two or three heart failure, and clearly show mortality benefit over medical therapy and over the uh, over the uh, uh, amiodarone. And definite a study just looking at non-ischemic population, low EF, and that actually showed the borderline statistic significance for benefit ICD. And the reason borderline, uh, and come back to the heart failure guideline, why we wait for nine months, is because non-ischemic trial of a definite half the patient, 47% of the patient, actually enrolled within nine months of, of diagnosis of heart failure. Okay, that's where the Heart Failure Society insisted you want to be more than 90, nine, nine months of therapy. Oh yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of people in Scott have is uh yeah, all groups in Scott have benefited I C D. All groups, yeah. And uh I believe more uh in Scott have a non ischemic than the ischemic. Yeah. So this is a break uh breakdown of uh, the numbers. Uh if you look at Scott have two thousand five hundred patients, mean age is sixty, mean EF twenty five, follow up forty five months and optimal medical therapy and control group. And that is the, uh, the the control versus the ICD for mortality. Companion the CRT trial, I'm not going to talk about today. Must do when the 700 patient, and uh, you look at the follow-up is, is 40 months with the mean EF is 30 percent, and that's also showed. Uh, see, must is a 0.06 p-value, right? So it's just borderline. Made it two is the one that is EF is 30 30 percent or lower than MI, and that shows very convincing. Uh, mortality benefit. So this is a must. Uh, looking at the four groups in the must uh, in 2002, if you look at EF inducible, low EF, which is the lower, well, which is this one. So, so the low EF with the inducible one has the highest uh, uh, mortality, and uh, in in this group, where if you have greater than uh, EF, uh, EF with greater than 30 percent with non inducibility your event uh, rate is much lower. So this, essentially, you can dichotomize those patients in EF low, high than 35, 30%, inducible, non-inducible, you can separate those two curves big time for the uh, must. Made it two separated, and I want to call your attention to this because I'm going to mention it later on. Made it two is the one that rem reminds you 30% EF are lower with the MI risk, or MI history, right? And this is a good number in ICD trials, right? 700, 500 patients in a defibrillator and control group. And follow up is uh, four years. I want to call your attention to the separation of the curve. And this curve separation is almost one year separation. So the first year of made it two, the patient did not benefit from a defibrillator over medical therapy. And so, uh, so just remind about that. So there's really not a lot of rush to, go, to get into the ICD if somebody, you think EF might improve or somebody just had an MI. Scott have the same kind of phenomena. So Scott have uh, all comers of low EF, class two or above, heart failure, lots of patients enrolled in three arms, right? So ICD arm, amiodarone arm, and placebo arm. And if you look at it, the separation it's also after a year separation of a, of a benefit over medical therapy. All right, so those are the summary of a meta-analysis looking at the primary prevention studies from made it, made it to companion definite gut health, and they did not uh, include the uh, dynamite over there. But those are, if you look at all the numbers, the over about 6,000 patients in this meta-analysis, the hazard ratio is 0 0.7 with the P value, very significant. And that's from Arthur of seven trials. So clearly, I think uh, with all the trial, uh, primary prevention really, really works. So then where are those data uh, from regarding three months of waiting for PCI and cabbage and 40 days and nine months? We threw away all, threw around all those numbers, okay? So if you look at the made trial, the patient inclusion the two months post AMI and three months post PCI. So, so it's, and then three weeks after myocardial infarction, that's made it. 
So essentially, it's a, when we say waiting for 40 days, waiting for three months, those really going back, look at the trial, and, and those are the trial that really made a difference and made it, made it two and Scott have. Those are the ones give you, for instance, the made it two, wait for three months after revitalization. Okay, that's where the guideline come from. It's a three months of waiting. And you made it two is waiting for one month after MI. And after made it two, the dynamite showed the 40 days, is you know, within 40 days. So extend another 10 days that you should not, you should wait for 40 days instead of just one month. The, I mentioned the definitely the one that a diagnosis, uh, look at it, 47% people uh, had uh, nice ischemic less than uh, nine months uh, duration. So that is where the dynamite is not significant, p-value is not significant, people think because you have not waited long enough, the heart failure. So that's uh, nine months uh, really come from. And again, the, uh, this is a dynamite Dynamite is enrollment is a MI between six days and 40 days. So that's, if they enroll six days to 60 days, you would have a two months, I think, right? So but unfortunately, they just did a uh, six to uh, 40 days. But, but look at the mated two and Scott have this curve separation after six, 12 months. So I think you have a lot of wiggle room. And uh, people ask me a lot to do a uh, life lesson. Everybody post, uh, they diagnose the CA, you know, like a uh, post cabbage, EF low waiting for recovery. They, everybody tell me I should put everybody on a life west and I, waiting for EF recovery. And I can just quote the data that, you know, look at all the, nothing separated after a year, right? So, so that's what I can ward them off, yeah. In by benefit? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, yeah. That's always our struggle, you know. Yeah. You're outside for 30 days, but if you don't, or you have to complete your mass motivation, you then say you can only wait 40 days. Yeah. I have not seen the EF changing that much from the PCI or cabbage. I think if you see EF draw, uh, improve after three months, it's because of stunning of myocardium from ischemia, not so much of a, so I, and I think uh, EF is is one thing that your your restoration probably don't change so much. Number one, number two, I think the PCI itself, lots of data that we can have a different discussion about this. That PCI cabbage don't really remove the the whole um, ischemic, uh, uh, no, the electric instability trigger. So therefore, I don't think you can say I did a PCI. Therefore, patient is safe to go home. Mm. Are there any studies that look at, for example, the car burden, the ischemic, the subtype of the ischemic, something like that, and we know that the AF is lower, there's a high chance of improvement versus that low to another element? Well, um, not in the ICD trials, but in the heart failure trials. And if you look at MI, you know, late enhancement, all the, all the uh, MRI data, clearly some myocarditis, you know, if you have early on, you look at MRI and you follow, people have a high chance of re recovery. So uh, and I, and I think uh, there are two kinds of things to put patient at risk. One is even if you don't have a scar, is, is the inotropic, not inotropic, Iron, iron channel issues. So st electric instability had nothing to do with with uh, scar, ischemia, and all stuff. You can just you know have a. a so th those are the intrinsic stability issue. And the other one is the scar related issue. So those. So so therefore, based on the scar, to say whether you're safe or not safe, uh, uh, it's it's hard to uh, to judge. So <clears throat> remaining questions uh, is actually use of primary prevention. How does it compare to secondary prevention benefit versus uh, how we do in this country in terms of distribution, primary, secondary prevention, ICU use? Second, it, does the mortality benefit last beyond the trial years? And that need to look at it, right? So you can't just look at the trial itself. And how often do patients with ICD have therapy? And that's very important. You're putting a lot of ICD, how many people really use it, right? 
a profit versus the in appropriate use. And what is the number to treat in comparing with other device or drug therapy? And this is related to cost effective analysis of ICD for primary prevention. And lastly, can we do better to improve cost effectiveness? And those are the ones that really, I think, uh, is not in, in the guideline, but those are the behind the guideline why we do uh, recommend the ICD for primary prevention. And so, first question, is it as good as secondary prevention? Absolutely. So if you look at the first three trials, AVID trial, CAS trial, and SID trial, those are the secondary prevention trial. And if you look at all the primary, primary prevention trial on the right, they are very actually similar and better compared with the secondary prevention trial for all cause mortality reduction. So there's no question that uh, primary prevention and secondary prevention, they offer equivalent protection with ICD for sudden death. In this country, after MADE2, there's a big increase of, before MADE2, well, most of these are reversed, is more secondary prevention than primary. But after MADE2 published, EF is 30% or lower with MI history. All of a sudden, we took off, right? So, and then the Scott have adding another uh, stimulus. So, primary prevention ICD use accounted for 70% of use and 30% uh, are secondary prevention. Okay, so so we clearly do more now for primary prevention, and with a good reason because they offer as good, if not better, for protection for sudden death. So long-term benefit, uh, so from 2010, uh, uh, so they look at maybe two patients, the same trial patient that just followed long-term for up to eight years. And the curve continued to separate, and the benefit is almost the same every year onwards, so, which is very striking. So this is a solid evidence that the defibrillator works for the primary prevention for a long-term up to eight-year follow-up. And we're going to continue to see more follow-up and that's why we see more sick people, sicker people in our, in our, the, our patient population, right? Because I actually keep them live longer, right? And so you see a lot of end-state heart failure now. So how about shock? How many people use it for a proper shock? If you look at MADE2 in that four-year trial window, it's over 37% people require shock for VTVF. Now, you could argue that based on the care, um, uh, made it rich study. If you program more stringently, for instance, if you raise the shock rate higher, or if you put in uh, the uh, the ATP there, so you may not, you may not, or you bring the window bigger. So before you say 10 out of 12 ET, I'm going to shock you. Now if you say you know 18 out of 24. So this data may be a little bit murky because you see that you know 37% people got shocked for VTVF. May not be true. This is overestimate. Overestimate, right? Is it, I think there might be some data about survival after the first shot. Yeah. I, 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 uh, yeah, I think the, the made it two data looking at the, the mortality and heart failure after the shock, and turns out the shock itself increased mortality in patients in made it two, and also increased hospitalization of heart failure. So shock is bad for you. Yeah, so it's an indicator of a sickness, and yeah, 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 yeah. It's yes or no because when people look at the scud half and look at the shock for sinus rhythm because of noise, shock for SVT, they did not increase mortality. Okay, so so some some uh, something about the shock itself. So scud half, if you look at a, a proper shock is about 20 some percent and in a proper shock is about 10 percent. So it's, it's not totally benign. You did ICD for primary prevention. There's some appropriateness in in a proper shock, and both shocks increase uh, mortality. Yeah, especially with mortality. Yeah. AFib shock and VTVF shock they carry high mortality compared with the SVT shock and noise shock and sinus shock. Okay, so something about AFib also increases mortality if you get ICD shock. So in the scud have about 31% of patients had ICD shock in 40 months. In the made it two, in, 40, in four years, about 37% got shocked. So 37, one third of people received the shock therapy. And we always 
happy when they get shocked because, oh, your life got saved. When I was a fellow EP fellow, a patient come to my clinic and didn't even know he got shocked during sleep. And I said, gosh, you actually just saved your life. You didn't even know. So we can show the patient all the treating. It was beautiful. But now as I grew older, I realized those shocks probably doesn't mean, <laughs> doesn't mean it saved life. I probably, because, you know, think about this. I mean, this is a, this is a very, very often, I, I see this often that patient mind their business, EF is low, had no syncope story. A month after the ICD put in, boom, they got shock. You see this typical story. Why? Because we program it that way, so to ask the device to shock them. But if you program now with a made it rich study, you know, you do 24 out of 36 detection window, you're not gonna shock the guy with non system VT. So we didn't really save the patient, it's just we, we actually feels good, right? So you, <laughs> we, feel, we feel very good that got shocked, but yeah. Okay, number two treat, this is a compare with uh, RCD, primary prevention, secondary prevention, CRT, and drug therapy. And I'm not gonna go into this detail, it depends on how you use the math mathematical model regarding the you know, Medicare money, insurance money, all kind of hospital, different hospital charge. But in any way, it's comparable in terms of number to treat, in terms of the, uh, so number to treat is very, very good, right? So in the ICD, if you look at the MEDI2 is 11, number to treat, Sky have a 14, went to, you know, 14 number to treat, and uh, drugs is even much more. So, <clears throat> The comparison, I lost a slide, but comparison of ICD with AED and stent in terms of cost, ICD is actually not bad at all. I bought that. But the problem is ICD high was 70,000. You know, what's the considered to be cost effect in this country is related to the old days of 60,000. Remember, $60,000 is a cutoff for cost effectiveness. And that was years, years ago's data. Now we should not use the 60,000, but nobody actually adjusts that, that number. But when the Congress passed a law to cover hemodialysis patients in this country, because the insurance company doesn't want to cover, and that's the word they choose the $60,000 per life year saved. And we, ever since then, we start using $60,000. Until today, we still use $60,000, and that's not right. right. So we should factor in all the inflation and all the other stuff. So, but in any case, it's pretty good except that you gotta consider premature ICD, battery depletion, lead failure, and all the other bad stuff. And then you realize that this calculation is based on a projection of how many years the patient number one can live, how many years the device will survive of a defect. And those are the two big unknowns, right? If you have a patient of 85, and we got 90 year old asking for ICD, give me a break, and it's not gonna be 60, $70,000 per life there, sir. That's gonna be like a million dollar, right? So, uh, and then we got device failure, the lead failure. So, so I think if you factor all those things, according to the question that we really need to do something better about ICD selection. And that is the reason I give the talk for the Grand Runs here uh, in the Common Hotel about a year ago, right? About what can we do to do better for patient selection. If you look at SCUD have five year data, I mean, we talk about guidelines today, and but I'm gonna give you some of my take about, I think the guideline is a big fishnet and try to get everybody, but I think the cost effectiveness really should be called into question. SCUD have clearly everybody lower than 35% EF, doesn't matter etiology, you wait for three months, good therapy, you give ICD. But look at what you do to the patient. In five years of SCUD have, if you do 100 patients, seven life saved in five years, okay? Not even, so about 1.5 a year, not even 1.5 a year of patients saved. But 30, 30 out of 100 die anyway, it doesn't matter if you get ICD or not. And 33 patients during the five years never notice the difference. So they don't get shock, they don't get anything. So they get five year of battery running and, and nothing. So 30 die, 33 actually don't do a thing. And then you know, appropriate shock 20%, and 10% complication. Those are the major complications we're talking about. So this is pretty bad. If you, if you think about it, we do 100 patients in five years, seven lives saved, but a lot of other things uh, you know, not very appealing to you. So that's why we need to do better for the ICD patient uh, primary prevention. And this is one of the study uh, published uh, in JAK, looking at 
uh, just like a, a chat and chat with scores. And if you look at a score system, you have NIH is uh, class three, BON is high, QRS is greater than 120, and age is greater than 75, uh, 72 year old. So if you have any one of those, any two of those together, your mortality, two year mortality here, greater and equal to two is up to here. And the medical arm of the MEDI2 is equivalent. So it means that if you got two out of those four criteria, even though you're fitting to the primary prevention guideline, you got two out of the four, your mortality benefit compared with medical arm is the same, same kind of mortality. Same kind of, this is a subgroup analysis, right? So, so what we need to do is a prospectively, and I was looking at uh, who is doing the prospective study answering this question, nobody is doing it because it's so costly to do this study. It's so costly that it almost prohibitory to do this kind of study prospectively. And so uh, I don't think they're ever going to have a, a, a study to have a score system and, and say, if you got those two out of four, you're not going to have the ICD. Yeah, so they can validate. They, this data are validated already, but nobody is using it. <laughs> it it's like, uh, you know, maybe two is validated if you have a micro uh, voted T wave alternate negative. The British uh, uh, physician group that did a study, maybe two population, and, and you do screening with a micro voted T wave alternate. And if they're negative, you follow them for five years, not a single person died. And that led into the master study, and, but can never get into the guideline. Why? Because we have zero tolerance to death in this country, right? So that's the problem that we're facing. So let's quickly talk about the, uh, the patient that not covered by all those trials, because this is very important because we struggle. And like the first three cases I give you, uh, those are gonna be answered by, by, the, uh, by those, okay? So it's clear cut. If I give you all the clear cut cases, you'll be no fun, right? So, <laughs> so, so that's why this is the most recent updated one. I want you to to know uh, that population one patient with abnormal troponin that don't fit fit, uh, fit the criteria for MI, but pre previously they thought to be qualified for ICD for primary prevention. Recommendation wait, uh, so you don't wait for 40 days. So you come in with a troponin, but before, say, you look at a year ago, EF is already 25% on good drug therapy already. Come in with troponin elevation, God knows what's the reason, for instance, type 2 MI, AC interference, renal failure on dialysis, whatever. So you deem those troponin is, has nothing to do with MI, then you don't have to wait for 40 days. Okay, so you had to justify. Otherwise, it's a male practice, right? So you had to justify this troponin, I don't believe is MI, therefore you can go for it. But you make sure though, the EF a year ago was actually indeed is a chronic EF, not something that you miss, you have not uh, tried to do a PCI or cabbage. Of ovular disease you miss, right? So number two is a patient within 40 days of acute MI who have known left uh, LVEF drop and previously satisfied for in-person primary prevention. So, do you want to give ICD or not? Within 40 days of acute MI, who have known EF low. Say a year ago, two years ago, EF is 20%. Yes. 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 Um, in this guideline, it didn't say, but say you plan to reverse rise. Then you, have, you, then you wait for three months, and then if you don't, what would you do? So say the EF is 20% now, uh, acute MI, but, but no EF is low, but two years ago is also low. Recommendation, not. <laughs> so I have been doing just what you, you just said. I have been just looking at the low EF and say, well, you're coming with acute MI, your EF is low anyway. I'm gonna just give you, I've been doing this until this, this guideline uh, consensus come out, is no. And the reason being that uh, the rationale, number one, so there's no harm to wait, I made it to, and Scott have I mentioned to you, the separation curve is, is much later. So you don't, you don't have to jump into it, that's number one. 
Number two, the dynamite uh, trial, actually, if you look at the acute MI, they don't really look at how severe the MI. But acute MI patient in the first 40 days, the half of the people died of other disease, other non-sudden deaths related, rupture, anterior wall rupture, pump failure, and all the other stuff. So that is the reason that the consensus says that, and iris, again, iris is 41% lower risk in the ICD group, a significant increased risk of uh, non arrhythmia deaths also in the iris. So the acute MI page uh, trial, the Dynamet and iris trial, clearly in the first 40 days, if you do the ICD, you don't benefit because it's a half the patient died of a non-sudden death. ICD doesn't benefit. Was this Well, nobody had this info. Those are the first MI people. Irish and the Dynamite, we don't have any. Yeah. So they, they cited those, but they also cited the mated and scattered separations. Is no, no, doesn't hurt to wait. There's no, there's no point of doing it right away. So you're probably going to select out the 50% people drop dead uh, within the next six months or so. So, so then you save the ICD. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you're saying it's kind of like the year. If this patient's going to live, you survive your 40 days, so now is the best. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 I mean, this is actually, I think it was coming to a surprise to me, but I think it's reasonable to argue this way, but some people are going to argue the other way, but the expert consensus statement that you should not do it for the first 40 days. I wait for a few months. <laughs> I would probably wait for a month now to do the ICD. Nobody's going to fault me for that. So number three, uh, those are the ones that uh, one of the cases I mentioned to you, somebody need a pacemaker. So if you, either within the third 40 days of MI, or 90 days of uh, three months of a cabbage or PCI, or nine months of newly diagnosed within, this is all within, okay? So it means, means that those are either within the MI 40 days within the three months of resuscitation and within 99 months of heart failure. And then if you have a, a uh, indication of a pacemaker who otherwise qualify for ICD, then you should just give the ICD. And this is based on the cost analysis of repeat surgery and also based on the infection risk. So you should go for it. And I would say that you know, initially I, I gave a hypothetical one, cabbage plus AVR with a low EF just to throw a wrench. Because I think in that situation, I think EF will improve. So therefore, you do it probably wrong. So I would give a life rest for three months and then, then do the ICD three months later. So if you got AVR three, and uh, if you look at the cabbage, what's the, what's the average EF improvement by cabbage is very low. It's about 5 percentage. So you don't think about cabbage going to improve. But AVR, on the other hand, you might improve big time. So if you are streaming the AVR, I would do differently. So this population patient, significant low EF, for within 40 days post MI, who are also listed for transplant, who undergo transplant evaluation. So ICD or no ICD? Huh? So if you're within 40 days, then you should not. So this is the very recommend, okay? So, and then uh, it's different from the class 2A indication I mentioned earlier from this year's guideline of a heart transplant. If a chronic low EF and uh, waiting for transplant, you should give for bridging if you already qualify for, for transplant. But if you're 40 days within the MI and uh, also listed, then you should not do the ICD. Number five, 90 day, uh, patient within 90 days of reassurance, three months of reassurance, who have known low EF and who have previously satisfied criteria. So this is the one that uh, the number one case, the EF got to be unlikely to improve over 35, but also not within 40 days, and has to be what? The class two heart failure. Yeah. Right. Well, 
based on my practice, it's based on the echo readers and really the akinesis and, and hypokinesis. But I think we should go further. I think akinesis and echo is so inaccurate that if I'm really truly convinced, I should go for the MRI and or uh, or even go to uh, other modalities. I think EF is terrible. I think they actually mentioned in the discussion that you, you should choose a better modality. On that last one, it's yeah. Kind of like Get out of jail free card from more guideline, right? I mean, that's, I have a little challenge with that. It's to say, well, like you said, that's unlikely to improve. Yeah. I mean, because then that kind of, well, then I'm going to choose this. I mean, then the line now is going to say every single patient is going to fall within that guideline. If well, but if you 20% EF, and you go for cabbage, you have 10%, you need 10, 15%, right? right? right. So, but if you're 30, 30, 30, 30%. So, someone at 15%. so if you're 35%, you know, you're going to improve, right? Yeah. So I think it's bar you got to see how big the window you need to improve. That's how likely. And then you do the echo, you say, well, these are akinesis, not like hypokinesis, global hypokinesis. So that, that's how we judge it clinically. So the rationale is, uh, as I mentioned, that if you look at the cabbage patient, uh, EF improvement is minuscule. And that been supported by the two studies that published before. And so, if you look at uh, in patient with reduced EF undergoing cabbage, thirty percent patient had improved EF, but although only six percent had improved over five percent. So it's minuscule, right? So, so number six patient scenario is uh, there's a lot of wording. So, but this is, I promise this is probably the last one. So, patient uh, less than nine months uh, diagnosis of heart failure, not ischemic, and uh, had, uh, who have significant heart failure symptoms and low EF. So recommendation, number one, within the first three months after initial diagnosis uh, of yes or no? Ask you guys. Number A, no? Yeah. So B, three to nine months after initial diagnosis, if recovery is unlikely, yes or no? Nine months. Okay, so those are the recommendations by those. Yeah. So there's a population of patients that have a genotype. And now you me a mixed picture. You probably would would based on what was it's gotta be one is dominant than the other. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't think uh, you have make fifty fifty percent. I would I would go for the one that I think is dominant one. So if somebody got a single vessel disease stented, you have twenty percent. I don't think that's CAD related, right? So so that's why I'm gonna look at it. Yeah. And if on the other hand, somebody a cabbage, you have twenty percent. I also have hypertension induced uh, heart failure. I probably go for the ischemic one. So this is one I mentioned to you uh, about the uh, how how much myocarditis patients improve, and this is actually constitute the reason why the non-ischemic ones newly diagnosed we should wait longer. Okay, how long? And now the American heart failure is nine months. European just recently says it's three months. And we don't have a clue how many months uh, it takes for non-ischemic to improve. And myocarditis data looking at here, the 300 some patients with a low EF, new onset, and uh, less than four months uh, from initial diagnosis followed for, for four years. And if you look at 70% patients had absolute increase of greater than 10%, and 25% of patients normalized the EF in people with myocarditis. Now, I don't have a data to see how long they followed for four years. So uh, I need to go in to look at the fine print to see if they have initial diagnosis less than six months. And then if they follow another, say, uh, starting from that onwards, do a optimal medical therapy, how many people within three months, six months, nine months, they recovered? And that data is probably there. I didn't go have a look. Okay. Quickly go over the uh, primary prevention for the rare genetic conditions. As you all know, all the other ones are channelopathy ones, okay? And to give you some update about the HOCOM, this is something new this year uh, for the European guideline, which I 
I learned myself in preparation for this talk, which is very useful. Okay, what for for how come patients if they got syncope, you know, uh, aborted cardiac arrest, no brainer, the secondary prevention. We talk about primary prevention. How do you decide? So we look at all the risk factors. The one in, in black, those are the traditional ones we look at it, right? non VT, sickness of uh, greater than three centimeter, family history, sudden death, unexpressed syncope, and abnormal blood pressure drop during you know, exercise. Those are the traditional ones. And then the uh, and later ones are the apical aneurysm, myocardial fibrosis, and inherited gene mutation, multiple mutation. So those has not made it into the stratification yet. So this is called a Holcomb risk sudden death study, a multi-center uh, retrospective longitudinal cohort over almost like a 4,000 patient. And Dr. Marion is one of the, the first authors of this paper. What they do is that they look at a traditional way where you're looking at the risk stratification, looking at all those ones in, in black. The limitation of looking at those is that, for instance, if you look at the thickness of a three centimeter, that's a, bi that's a binary decision, right? Either greater or, but is it really the, that's the continuous risk uh, factor. It's not the binary. So that's one problem of the, the old way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is the old way of looking at how come for primary prevention is that none of those are weighted. So we just say two out of six factors or two out of four factors, and then you go for ICD. And nobody, I mean, I chat with this with Dr. Adaba because he did the research with Dr. Barry Marin. And essentially what they say that if you're greater than two out of these five things, actually another thing added here is a gradient. Uh, exercise gradient. And it would be six, six factors, you two out of six, and then you should go for defibrillator. And, but it, you didn't wait for those, right? Wait in how they contributed until they study, they actually look at what's the, the relative contribution of each factor in, in deciding the sudden death risk in this longitudinal cohort. And in this, they added a little more. They actually added in a left atrial diameter. And LVOT gradient there on top of what, what we have before, okay? And this is a calculation. You actually can just, <laughs> you can, you can actually, don't, don't, don't look at this, but you can just pull out your, 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 your calculator, just like you calculate the grade score or your team score. It's on your palm. So just go to that one and then you can plug in all those and it will give you, look at, the wall thickness and they have two factors over there that really considered mathematical model. This is very predictable based on their study that they're weighting the uh, different factors in, in, in relation to their contribution to the risk. And you know, something that you should consider put on your palm and the next time you have a whole come calculated it, okay? And so this is based on that, the European guideline a few months ago, August, three months ago, they updated their guideline. So, so you look at the Holcomb, uh, asymptomatic Holcomb people, and you got all the risk factors you tabulated, and then you do the score. And the score gives you a percentage of risk. If you're greater than, say, five years, greater than 4% uh, risk, that's intermediate risk. ICD maybe, that's a 2B indication. But if you're high risk, that's a 2A indication, okay? So, but if you got VF, that's one, in the, one A indication. So, so those are a really quantitative way of looking at Holcom, which is something new, just in uh, just a few. Yes. So they look at the part of the fibrosis, right? So the, those are the um, those are uh, you mean whether to factor in that? Yeah, so the those are like aneurysm, yeah. fibrosis, the gene markers. And it, you know, if you if you put those three in here. You may have a different calculation, maybe more accurate in the future. But they didn't, I mean, it's hard to go back. This is a retrospective, right? It's hard to, to go back and look at the gene. Not everybody got gene markers, and not everybody got a MRI marker. But this is a pretty good now already, right? So you think of Holcomb quantification, this is a pretty good uh, study. So quickly about uh, Brugada update, what do you do about Brugada? If you're asymptomatic, if you're pilot, what do you do? If you're not a pilot, what do you do? 
this is my patient, 53 year in the VA. And I said, you should not fly a commercial airplane. So he actually want me to free, release him. Writing a letter, I said, no, absolutely not. Okay, so, so I didn't write a letter. But I don't know what to do with him in terms of his certification. Okay, he had no, I mean, he's adopted, so I don't know his parents, how they died, right? So it's another patient with Brugada. If you follow up 160 months, and this is the community follow-up, 45 events, uh, so 8.2% 8, 8 uh, patient that had the event, either death or resuscitation arrest. Uh, in, uh, so this is about almost 10% uh, patient that died. No, they're not. This is just the Brugada EKG without any symptom, okay? So Brugada brothers then decided to use EP study and to see if we can actually figure out who's gonna die, who's not. They actually do EP study, they don't do the ICD, they let them go if they're positive, okay, or negative, doesn't matter, and follow them. And in their study, they found that the negative predict value is very, very good in the 90s. If you, if you can't induce any VTVF, they think it's pretty good. But their research really got refuted. No, they wrote a guideline in 2005 and everybody started doing EP study until uh, later somebody did a, a really good analysis. This is Dr. Perry. She's actually another leading uh, scientist, uh, physician, lung QT in Brugada. And they listed all the trials of Brugada EKGs and type one Brugada EKG without syndrome, right? No syncope, no arrest. And turns out only the Bugatti brothers ones that got a really high mortality, everybody else is very low, very low. So something really not right about their patients. <laughs> so of course, if you have that high mortality, of course the EP studies seem to maybe show some benefit. Or if you have such a low mortality, what's the benefit you're gonna show EP studies? Probably not. So this is the Bugatti actually wrote article hijack the whole high rhythm society. You know, the Brugada brothers, they're not from the US, but they seem to convince the, the high rhythm people here to, to endorse them. So this is in 2005, if you look at asymptomatic patients that uh, with the Brugada EKG, they really wanted to do EP study. Look at that, EP study, 2A. So that's 2005. Everybody just cry for, that guy remember this when it comes and, Benny and I, we talk about this, you it can't be kidding me, because the mechanism of Bogata is all VF. How do you induce VF? Well, I can induce you matching to VF easily. And they don't even say, you know, single, double, or triple extra stimuli. They say, if I induce you, you get ICD. So everybody hated, but then the, they got a consensus statement out in 2005. And uh, so then the European, uh, essentially in 09 did some modification. They said that you can't be kidding me, everybody else has a low mortality, only got a higher one. So over here, they want a 2A, right? But if you look at 2000, uh, 2009 European guideline, they definitely modified. Those are the patients even with syncope. Okay, if you look at your patient with Brugada syndrome, ARVC, how come if you say may be performed, and that's 2B. So right away, I think Europeans realized only Brugada has a high mortality. So they lowered it down. And even further, so this is one that uh, European, uh, European high rhythm joined the, the effort. And this is actually a good one for you to sort of uh, remember. If you have an arrest, go to for ICD, if you have Brugada. But if you have a type 1 EKG with syncope, and you think it's possibly VT, you go for ICD. So those are the class one, class two A, right? But if you don't have any symptoms, you just have an EKG, you do the EP study, inducible, maybe. So that's two, what is two B in the case, right? So it's two B, it's not two A. So that means that people have question mark about your EP study, right? So it's not the two A. If it's two A, then you sure you believe the EP study, but right? it's a two B. If you know inducibility or no EP study, then your asymptomatic ones, then you should not go for the defibrillator. Okay, so so my guy with the asymptomatic uh, pilot guy, I'm 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 not allowing him to fly, but I'm not gonna give him an ICD. Right. So to summarize uh, the 
I know I have a few others about shagas and, and neuromuscular disorders and other stuff we don't really have time to talk about. I'll just summarize this about post MI is very easy. So if you low, low EF, 35% or lower, then the scut have ICD. If you're 30% low with the history of MI, you really don't need a heart failure. Just go for ICD. Okay? But if you're 40%, 35 to 40%, you go for must if you find the non systemic VT. And this is, the, this is the arm that we miss, right? So when we, when we see EF is 35 to 40, we throw them away. In reality, you really should do is to put a halter on the patient. And if you see non systemic VT and with the history of CAD, you refer him to me. All right? And now ischemic ones is also easy. It's got to have 35% class 2. Always make sure it's class two or more. Okay, class four is contraindicated, but class two and three you should go for it. And then the uh, then the CRT, and then there's uh, unexplained syncope. This is a tricky one. Unexplained syncope EF lower than 40% ICD. There's really not a single trial looking at that, but that's what we uh, do. If you got non-ischemic EF is low, but not lower than 35%, but you have syncope, ICD is indicated. That's it. Hmm? No, no. The reason, the reason that that uh, this listed here, when I was a fellow, there was research looking at predict predictability of EP study in nine schema is not predictable, so it's useless. If you CAD MI, then EF forty, you can have a pretty high predict value, but nine ischemic is not predict value, so. There's no other things you can do. Any question? Yeah? Five minute break and start. Thank you. Yeah. We're a lot of material. <laughs> This is going to be on your board. Oh, yeah. Actually, another in service like that, over and over. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like then everyone is.